This is lecture nine. I'm going to talk to you about how to read messier data sets into SAS, or at least some, some additional issues in reading data into SAS. In the SAS certification prep guide, base prep guide, that is, this is, I believe, chapters 19 and 20. And so once we've gotten through this lecture, you can pretty much um, uh, start prepping for the certification uh, guide. So I'm just going to talk about five topics. I think this will be a pretty short video. Let's start with um, creating more than one record um, from, um, uh, from a line of input. So I've already shown you an example of this in a previous video, but now let's talk about it um, formally. So let's, um, let's consider a little data set where I have some numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on a separate line. And let's say I want to read that in, and each one of those numbers should be a separate record. So these could be measurements, and the first measurement is one, second measurement is two, third measurement is three, third is fourth is four, fifth is five. All right. Well, how would I do this? The answer is I'm going to stick a double at sign at the end of my input line. And so what that tells SAS to do is not move on to the next line of input. So by default, whenever SAS um, has an input statement, it expects one line of input. Once it gets to the end of that, it goes on to the next line. That double at says, don't go to the next line. So if, um, if, if we run this, you will see that what you get is what you expect. It reads in the first four numbers, then, okay, it's out of data. What does it do then? Well, then it goes on to the next line and it continues reading five, six, seven, eight. Now it's out of data. It tries to go on to another line, but there is no additional line, so it stops. I think it's probably useful to illustrate what happens without the double at. So I've copied the program below, but this time I've not included the double at. So everything is identical with the exception of the missing double at. So what happens here? Well, here I'm saying, uh, SAS, go find a number x and then go on to the next line. So it finds a number x and I didn't tell it to read anything else on this line, therefore it goes on to the next line. The output data set then would have only two observations, 1 and 5, and it would just ignore all the data that comes after that first number on each line. So that's, uh, that's how you uh, create more than one record from one line of input. Let's move on. And to be honest with you, I've used this in this particular uh, uh, option once in over 20 years of SAS programming. So it's not something I do very often, um, but it's in the base prep guide and I might as well show it to you. So very rarely you will have a situation where the input file has more than one um, line in it for uh, a, a, you know, a single record. So I think the easiest way to describe this is with an example. Let's say we had something like this. Customer number one has named Joe Smith. And then on the next line, we know that Joe Smith lives at 123 Main Street. And on the next line, we find out that Joe lives in Chicago, Illinois. Then let's see, the next customer in our database is Mary Jones, who has an ID of two. She happens to live at 1345 Lincoln Street in Evanston, Illinois. Now notice how everything is spread out over different lines. So how do I bring this in? There are a number of ways that you can do this. Um, I'm going to show you two ways, two equivalent ways. The SAS uh, CERT uh, prep guide shows you a, a third way that I'm not going to bother showing you. Okay, so approach number one is simply to put multiple input lines. I say, okay, SAS, I want you to go input first the customer ID, then the name. 
Then I have a separate input line for the next line. So go get me the address and then go get me a variable called city state. And then just, uh, we, 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 we covered strings in the last lecture. So just to illustrate how we might wanna use some string functions, if I wanted to pull out just the city, I could use the scan function. I want the state, I would also use the scan function. Maybe I just want the first name and I could also use the scan function. So lots of uh, really nice illustrations of the um, uh, scan function. Okay, so if you run this, what do you get? Well, okay, you get customer ID, the name, the address, the city state, and then here's those variables we computed. So city correctly strips off Chicago or Evanston. The state correctly strips off Illinois and the first name is just Joe or Mary. An alternative way is to do this with a single input statement. So I've illustrated this over on the right hand side. I can have a single input statement but I can insert slashes wherever I, I have, whenever I want SAS to go on to the next line of input. So this is completely equivalent to the multiple input um, version. Use whatever you like. Um, all right, that's that's it for creating one record from multiple lines of input. Um, again, I don't think you're going to encounter that, but it might be on the SAS certification exam, so it's worth one slide. This next topic, these are just miscellaneous topics for reading messy data is the way to think of this lecture. This next topic I encounter all the time and it, um, it's kind of a tough one to, um, to sort out if you don't know to recognize it. Once you know how to recognize it, uh, then, then it's pretty easy to, to, to sort out. Um, there's a, a long history of um, computing systems not being consistent, so they don't agree on a standard. So this is this is a this example or th this problem dates way back uh, to at least the 1980s. So one uh, one thing that would be nice is for computer um, operating systems to agree on what indicates the end of a line of input. And back in the 80s, um, they didn't agree. Actually, it goes way back into the 70s too. Um, with you know, so going back to the old Apple one, uh, Apple two days. So computer systems did not agree on what constituted the end of a line, and they just kind of ran off and and uh, uh, did did whatever they want. So there's a, a really nice description of this if you go to the Wikipedia page under the new line, all one word, entry. So let, let me just take you over to that. And this will give you the whole history. Uh, so the, uh, you can you can read about this yourself. Um, in essence, there are a couple different potential characters that could be used to indicate the end of a line. So one is called the line feed character, which is abbreviated LF. And what you'll see is that uh, Unix systems have always used line feeds to indicate the end of a line. Microsoft Windows, on the other hand, had to be different and decided that, you know, line feed wasn't good enough. We're going to put a carriage return and a line feed. So a carriage return is, a, is the name of another character. Um, so carriage return happens to be control M. Line feed happens to be control J. All right, so uh, Microsoft wanted both. The, the uh, origin of these terms goes way back to a line printer where you had a dot matrix uh, head that would move back and forth. Okay, a line feed would mean advance one line. If you, if you can remember a typewriter, that'd be like turning the paper up one notch. Carriage return, on the other hand, means bring that little dot matrix printer head all the way back to the left. 
So Microsoft said, well, we're going to uh, send a character both to um, uh, bring the printer head all the way back to the left and um, it, you know, advance the paper one notch, whereas Unix was just a line feed. You know, we're still stuck with this stuff today. Other computer systems uh, just used a carriage return. All right, so we're stuck with this. And uh, whenever you get a data file, that was created on some operating system other than the one that you're using, you have to tell SAS um, the end of line character is something other than what you're expecting. So we're doing everything on a Unix computer, which means that if we get a file that was cut on, uh, on, a, on, on a Windows system, then we're going to have to tell uh, SAS the end of line is a carriage return line feed. If you happen to be using PC SAS and you get something that was cut on a Unix computer, then you have to tell SAS the end of line character is just a line feed. And so we've already seen some examples of this. I'd now like to show you a little example of, um, of this. So I'm going to create a file. So I'm sitting on Harden right now, and let's make a file called example. Now, I'm going to insert a character, and the first character is going to be a capital A. Then I'm going to hit return, and I'm going to put a capital B here, and I'm done. So I have a capital A on the first line, and I have a capital B on the second line. Now let's hit escape. So the question is, how many characters are in this file? The answer is not obvious. So the answer depends on the operating system that I'm working under. So if I write this, okay, I've just written it as example. And if you look at the bottom, it tells me uh, two lines, four C was written. So 4C is four characters. So let's go, um, uh, I'm going to do an ls minus l. Uh, let's try an ls minus l on just example. There's a little bit too much stuff here. And so what you're going to see is that this 4 indicates the number of bytes in this file called example. Now, uh, I'm going to vi this thing again. And this time I'm going to uh, say colon set ff equals DOS. So ff stands for file format. DOS is, um, I'm going to set it to um, uh, be Microsoft rather than Unix because the default here on Harden is going to be um, uh, Unix. Now I'm going to write this out. So colon w example dot DOS, call it. All right. And so what you're going to see is that we have a new file. It's going to be called, it's a, a DOS format. It still has two lines. Now it has six characters. All right, so if we write, let's get out of this. I'll just quit. Uh, I've already written the thing. Let's do quit exclamation point. I'm going to do an ls minus l example star. And so what you're going to see is this uh, example.dos file now has six characters, whereas my example file only has four. So the question is, what, you know, just A and B, what, what are those extra characters in this file? Well, I wrote a little C program, and this C program will write out every character in the file along with the ASCII code. So... What is an ASCII code? If you go back to the course packet, actually, yeah, so we go back to our course packet and you click on this ASCII code, you're going to be brought to this Wikipedia page. And this Wikipedia page shows you um, the, uh, the, the ASCII codes. So uh, ASCII is, uh, stands for some standard something or other, American Standard Code for Information Interchange up here. And this is the uh, coding system that both Microsoft and Unix computers, including Macs, use to store data. 
Okay, so what you're going to see are all the characters on your keyboard, uh, and uh, I guess, and, and perhaps even some more. So let's go down to 65 to start out. So the number 65, looks like I can't highlight it, corresponds to the letter capital A. 66 is capital B, all the way through letter 90 is capital Z. Little a is 97, little z is 122. There's a few other uh, characters that I'll point out to you. So uh, let's start out with 9. 9 is a tab. Now remember I said that if you have a tab delimited file, you have to say the delimiter is 09x. What that means is the delimit character is this ASCII code number 9, which is a tab. All right. Now, if we go into 10, so I said uh, 10 happens to be control J. J is the 10th letter in the alphabet. That is what gives us a line feed. Um, ASCII code 13 is a carriage return. So you see LF for 10, carriage return is 13. And that, control M, M is the 13th letter of the alphabet, is, um, is a carriage return. And so there's other ones. 32 is a, is, a, is a space. And you get all your numbers starting at 48 through 57. So that's the way Unix stores a, well, actually, all uh, um, PCs and, and Unix computers store them using ASCII. Um, just as a little bit of trivia, uh, IBM computers had their own system called uh, EPSIDIC. But um, EPSIDIC's not used very much. At least I, I, I've never encountered uh, it outside of a, an old IBM mainframe. Anyway, I've written a little C program, and I've called it show. If I cat example, okay, now I send it to the screen, I can redirect the output to a program that I've written called show. And, oops, looks like I have to do dot slash show. Okay, so what show does is it prints the character in that file, and then it prints the corresponding ASCII code. So big A uh, has an ASCII code of 65, which was shown on that table. And the next code, in parentheses, is this carriage return. Right? So the start of the character, you know, so everything's shown in a parentheses. That's the character right there, and you're going to see that it's, it's actually 10. All right, so... It wasn't a carriage return, I lied. It's a line feed. Okay, so that's the second character. The third character in the file is a B, which has ASCII code 66. Then you have another line feed, which is a 10. Now let's do the same thing, except we're going to display the DOS file. Now if you display the DOS file, you're going to see that there's six characters. So the first character is an A, then you have a carriage return, then a line feed. Then you have the B, carriage return, and a line feed, uh, and you're done. So that's why, um, going back to this, you have four bytes in the example file, six bytes in the, in the uh, DOS version of that example, and the reason for that is because of these um, end-of-line characters. Unix just uses the line feed, DOS, the DOS version uses the carriage return and the line feed combo. All right, so that, that was a fairly lengthy explanation of end-of-line characters, but I think it's uh, worthwhile. Um, just noticed here is that 09x, which again indicates, you know, you got a tab. Tab is uh, synonymous with control I. I is the ninth letter of the alphabet. All right, um, I hope that's clear. Probably more information than you wanted on that. The next... Um, issue that I want to deal with, I'll call the star over commands. So star over, um, by star I mean wildcard, and there are four over commands, flow over, trunk over, miss over, and stop over. So what do, what do these do? Well, if you're going to try to read in data with a format, so if I say, you know, bring in a five character um, number, SAS is going to expect to find five characters. Now, what if there aren't five characters in your input file? 
then you have to tell SAS what to do. Now the default is to flow over. And flow over says just keep reading characters until you've filled those uh, five five characters for this for this numeric variable. And if you have to go to the next line, fine. It's, it's a bit unfortunate that this is the default um, because it really uh, it messes messes you up more than uh, than you'd want. The option that usually that you want is trunk over. So what trunk over means is fine if uh, you don't have enough characters, uh, just use that, you know, the, the truncated uh, uh, characters to, to you know, for, the, for the variable. So assign a value based on what you've got is essentially what trunk over says. Miss over says, well, if you don't have enough characters, set the variable to missing. Stopover says, uh, if you don't have enough characters, then stop processing. Let me give you a, an illustration of this. So here's my illustration. I've created a little data set called star over dot dat. Star over has five lines. The first line has exactly one byte, which is one. Second line is two bytes, two, two, and three, 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 four, 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 five, 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 five. And um, <clears throat> let's start with a little program to read this in. So let's read in star over. I don't have to say flow over because that's the default, but if I say star over, SAS won't complain. Now I'm gonna bring in a variable X, and if I put a format on it, it causes problems. If I did not put that format on it, I wouldn't have any problems, so uh, yeah. Now, what happens when you bring this in? Well, this is what happens. You don't get what you want. So you get a line 2, 2, then 4444 4, 4, 4, and 5555. Now why? Um, well, SAS reads in this line, and we told it to expect five bytes, five characters, and it only found one. So it reads on. It reads uh, you know, the next character, which I guess would be an end of line. Then it brings in 2, 2 with an end of line. Okay, now that buffer is full, so it outputs the 2, 2. Then it goes on, 3, 3, 3. Oh boy, now SAS is kind of confused. Uh, brings in 4, 4, 4, 4. The buffer is now full, so it outputs it. And then 5, 5, 5, 5. So again, I don't know, I'm, it's not entirely clear to me why SAS would make this the default option. I've, this is, I've never had an instance where this is what I want to happen. Okay. If you use the trunk over option, you get what you want. So here is what you want, and it just reads in 1, 2, you know, 1, 22, 3, 2, 3, and so forth. So here it says, you know, I was telling you to, to find five bytes. You only found one, but that's okay. You know, this variable's been truncated, fine. Just output it as it is. Let's take a look at the other two options. So if you use miss over, <clears throat> what happens is that if SAS doesn't find the five bytes, it sets the variable to missing. That's not something I've ever really wanted to do, but fine, it's, a, it's an option. The other one is stop over. So if you run stop over, you don't get any output. And if you go look at your out your log, this is what you get. So the input statement exceeded the record length. So you know we're trying to input five bytes. We only found one in that, so we stopped. And so you'll get that uh, that error message. You know, um, I just had a little idea. I'm getting creative in the middle of my video. This is um, this happens to be a file called infile 2sas that I was doing this in, and it just occurred to me what would happen if we inserted some spaces at the end of the line. If I did this, now I'm going to rerun this program. What should happen is that in all five instances, 
SAS is happy. And the reason SAS is happy is that um, it found those extra spaces and it could fill up the uh, you know the the, the input uh, buffer with with five characters. You know, it's filling up some of them with spaces, but the, it ignores the spaces when it reads a number. So um, that's one way to fix this problem. Uh, the other way to fix that problem again is not to format the thing in the first place. Just say input x, and then x is going to be a numeric variable. SAS would take what it finds and, and move on. Okay, but um, if you are using these formats and um, some of the variables might not be as long as you'd uh, told SAS, then you've got to uh, use the trunk over command. Okay, the last topic for this lecture is just an outline for reading and raw data. So when I um, start a project, I you know get some data from a system administrator and I got to read it in. I would recommend having a single um, program out there that reads in your data, uh, sorts it appropriately, and then run some basic descriptives that you're going to be coming back to dozens of times. So I always have a program. I call it read dat usually, or maybe a little sometimes if if I have a separate file, read posts for the posting file, for example, with um, air miles or read views. But I always start it with the word read as a signal to me that this is something that's reading in that data. And this is the, the general form that I usually follow. So you're going to have some sort of lim name. You're going to input your, you're going to create your formats. So notice the CNTL out. It says I want to create a format file for this project. Then you've got your data. So I'm going to read in the data and we'll start out with an in file. Then we're going to specify any additional links, tell SAS uh, the, the in formats, then give the input command. Maybe I'll have some additional um, commands to create some new variables. Sometimes there are problems to fix with certain variables. So I just stick all of those there. Then I'll have a label statement. When you have um, a survey, uh, you, you definitely want a label for every variable. Um, I don't always create labels for some of my database um, transaction files because the meaning of the variables are, are often a little bit more obvious there. But certainly when you have a survey, you want a label for every variable. Specify any formats for variables and then drop anything that's not necessary. The next thing I always do is to sort my data appropriately. So sort it by the primary key um, and you know, do this once rather than having to sort multiple times in the future. And then I always run contents, means, and print, as well as freak on any uh, com uh, you know, categorical variables in that database. And I keep this and I you know, come back to it hundreds of times um, in, the, in, in the future as I analyze that data set. So I'll just take you to a folder. Um, let's go to loyalty one. So when I got the data set, um, so here's my readdat.sas. My uh, input file is a little bit more complicated than yours, but you're going to see that it um, follows roughly that format. We got some lib names. Bring in all the, uh, create all the formats, and then um, what they gave me was a bit more complicated. And I'm using a macro, but what you'll see is um, uh, I bring in rewards or the transaction file, and it roughly follows what I said. So in file, in format input, length, format, maybe create some additional variables. Here's my label statement, here's my drop statement, and then um, this DSR is a macro that I'll talk about later, which runs the contents, the means, the, the freaks, and the, and the print for me, because I do that all the time. All right, so that's, um, that's it for advanced data step processing for now. We'll come back and do some more 
when we get to the next um, next certification guide.